Did you know? Despite piracy being rampant in China, Sony actually wanted to push the PlayStation 2 heavily in the region. Sony even told GameSpot they had no plans to introduce any new anti-piracy measures in China, and that they'd depend on law enforcement to take care of the issue. During the 2000s and 2010s, China went through an infamous gaming console ban, which meant the PlayStation 2 was only sold for a short time. Sony went on to note that the ban was their biggest hurdle, with then PlayStation of China manager, Q Xu Ming, stating, According to our internal sales data, there is piracy, as with other markets in Asia. But hundreds of thousands of copies can still be sold. Sony launched the PS2 in 2004, but was quickly stopped by China's Ministry of Culture, with only 10 PS2 titles being sold in the country. Sony's PlayStation division for China was shut down shortly after in 2005, lasting just over a year. But China wasn't the only region of concern for Sony. A Wall Street Journal article from June 2001 highlighted a report on piracy in Eastern Europe. The report estimated that around 63% of the total software market in 10 Eastern European countries was illegal. This was almost twice as high as Western Europe, which had a piracy rate of about 34% and three times higher than the United States, which was around 20%. And this is just an overview of the region. Some countries had far higher illegal sales than the average. Ukraine and Russia had a software piracy rate of an incredible 90%. The report estimated that the economies of these 10 countries stood to lose over $27 billion to illegal practices over the next three years unless piracy rates dropped the same levels as in Western Europe. Sony tried to prevent pirated games from being mass-produced and sold by keeping an eye on the PS2 market in Russia. With the aid of a private company, the Association Association for Prevention of Computer Crimes, or the APCC. In 2006, the president of the APCC, Felix Rosenthal, stated that the market for PS2 games in Russia was worth around $200 million a year. And since the country's software piracy rate was 90%, this meant Sony was losing their cut of $180 million of it. But it wasn't all bad news. Rosenthal stated that, thanks to the APCC's efforts, pirated PS2 game sales had dropped by 40 percent in Moscow. Sony even took measures to prevent the PS2 from being used to produce pirated products itself. According to an article from the official UK PlayStation magazine issue number three, Sony decided to bundle the UK's PS2s with a special kind of RGB SCART converter cable that produced a lower quality image than a true RGB SCART cable. This was because a true SCART cable would cause any DVD movies being played on the console to display a green image, as the PS2's RGB playback had been disabled for DVD movies. This was done to prevent quote-unquote perfect copies of DVD movies being recorded onto VHS tapes. While this seems like a standard anti-piracy protocol, the lower quality SCART cable sadly caused the image of movies to be displayed at a notably lower quality on the PS2. A representative of Sony told official UK PlayStation 2 magazine, the UK PS2 has been designed to meet rules and regulations that all European DVD players had to adhere to. Though disappointing, the magazine did give out some useful tips on how to best watch movies and play games in the highest possible quality. They listed using an S-video cable as the best way to watch DVD movies, and said the best alternative for gaming was to use an RGB SCART cable, which some had already used for playing games on the original PlayStation. Before we move on to the next bit of PS2 piracy history, we'd like to talk about today's sponsor, Baiyi. If you've ever used American sites to buy things from Japan, you've probably noticed how much sellers jack up the price. It can be a lot. This is where Baiyi comes in. Baiyi is a service that places orders or bids on your behalf on Japanese shopping and auction sites, then ships the items straight to you without any absurd price hikes. This includes sites like Rakuten, Amazon Japan, and Yahoo Japan Auction. So if you've been wanting to get hold of a Japanese game or piece of merch, but don't want to pay insane rates, this service will let you get your hands on the stuff for a more affordable price. Baiyi is easy to use and offers support in several languages, which of course includes English. They also ship worldwide, including to North America, Europe, and Oceania. Baiyi have over half a dozen international shipping methods, multiple payment methods, and four different insurance plans to match your needs. Baiyi is also giving Did You Know Gaming viewers a 2,000 yen, which is about 18 US dollars, first time purchase coupon for signing up through the link below. So if you want to try out this great service and get 2,000 yen of your first order, check out Baiyi using our link below. And now, back to the video. 
When designing the PlayStation 2, Sony was already preparing to combat piracy with their console. One of the PS2's first lines of defense was having data physically printed into the game discs in a rim. This data was dubbed the Wobble Groove, as it was a groove in the disc that produced a wobbling sound. This Wobble Groove held encryption data that would be processed during the Sony Computer Entertainment startup screen to help check if a disc was a legitimate PS2 game. Any illegitimate discs would trigger the PS2's infamous red screen of death to load in. The wobble groove couldn't be replicated using traditional disk burners of the era, but this didn't discourage hackers. In fact, this method of protection was completely defeated by simply swapping any official game disk with a disk burned with custom homebrew on it after the startup animation data had been loaded. This exploit would later be dubbed the game swap method of loading. But of course, Sony tried to prevent game swapping too. Their main attempt to counter it was to add three sensors to the PS2 disk drive that tell the system if the disk was removed. However, simply blocking these sensors with solid materials, such as electrical tape, paper, or even cardboard, would allow anyone to bypass the sensor's checks. Dattel, a company known for their third-party peripherals, became aware of the exploit and would later go on to sell the Swap Magic disc. Swap Magic is similar to an action replay and had all the authentications of a normal PS2 disc built in to take advantage of the game swap exploit. While the disc handled the authentication side of the the exploit, Dattel later bundled the product with the Swap Magic Lid, which could be installed on both the PS2 fat and slim models, and covered all of the sensors for the user, disregarding the use of tapes and papers. The PS2 reused some aspects of the original PlayStation's copy protection, meaning hackers were already somewhat familiar with the PS2's defenses from the get-go. As such, many hackers decided early on to focus their efforts on a new aspect of the PS2 its USB port. Custom USB tools such as the Neo Key were built to exploit the console in conjunction with an action replay or GameShark disc. The Neo Key would trick the console into thinking it would be running a PlayStation 1 disc, allowing the action replay to be read. However, it would then have the console switch modes as if it were reading a CD as a PlayStation 2. This allowed custom PS2 CDs to be read by the console. While effective, the exploit was limiting, as it only let gamers play the few hundred CD-based PS2 games and not the more widely produced DVD-based games. DVD-based games were a bit trickier to crack thanks to the PS2's Mechacon chip, which is short for Mechanics Controller. This chip is responsible for applying security measures to game discs, and would kick in whenever discs were being loaded. Sony built its games around the DVD-ROM format, and as such were flagged as DVD-ROMs when they were loaded. This caused a problem for hackers, as consumer-grade DVD burners would only burn discs in the DVD Plus R format. This made it easy for the Mechacon chip to identify discs as forgeries, since legitimate discs were DVD-ROMs and fakes used DVD Plus R but hackers are resilient. Since they couldn't remove the DVD Plus R format that most blank discs were sold with, they soldered some jumper wires in specific locations on the Mechacon chip so that it'd read all discs as both DVD-ROM and DVD Plus R discs. Despite introducing many kinds of anti-piracy measures, one kind of protection for the PS2 had to be completely dropped. Sony had planned for officially licensed memory cards to carry update data for the PS2 as the console's life went on. While this method proved to be possible, Sony pulled the plug on it due to the console having no form of internal storage to keep the update data installed permanently. A total lack of memory card protection led to plenty of exploits for the system, such as the popular free McBoot homebrew software, which let users simply save homebrew data onto a memory card from a custom disk. Another form of entry hackers tried to exploit was the PS2's new network and broadband capabilities. This eventually led to the development of the Open PS2 Loader, a homebrew program that lets users send their loaded game data to their PC, allowing them to back up their games digitally rather than burn backups onto a disk. Not only were hackers able to back up their games over a network connection, they could also play them from a PC hard drive as well, essentially streaming games to their PS2 from backups. Open PS2 Loader was commonly used to help preserve the PS2's sensitive disk laser, as no disk is needed to play the game
games after they've been backed up. Sony's response to the exploits came in the form of the PS2 Slim models, specifically their line of 90K Slim models. Sony's 90K Slim models were built with an updated BIOS that wouldn't allow any custom homebrew to be run on the system via disk, which in turn also helped protect the memory card. This too was ultimately overcome by hackers, who built custom mod chips that could be installed in a PS2 as possibly the most effective way to play homebrew software and game backups. One of the most popular mod chips of its time was the Messiah chip. It allowed almost every kind of DVD, CD, and PlayStation disc to be read. This gave the console some quality of life benefits such as region-free gaming, but also aided some more questionable practices as it enabled the use of pirated discs. The biggest hurdle with mod chips was all the soldering needed, as the Messiah required dozens of wires to be soldered to specific points on the system's main board. This was no easy task for the average user, and led to many people paying for the chip to be installed by experienced modders. To this day, hackers are finding more and more ways to crack into the PS2. An exploit dubbed Free DVD Boot was discovered by the hacker CTURT, and would allow the PS2 to load up homebrew and pirated games without any physical modifications to the console at all. This exploit works by tricking the console into thinking the inserted disc is a DVD movie, and using the disc's metadata to point the console towards executable files such as video games. While this method is convenient to boot homebrew games and software, the exploit needs to be tweaked for each piece of software the user wants to load. CTURT isn't a new name in the PS2 homebrew scene, and has developed a handful of tricks for the system over the years. In 2019, CTURT developed the YaBasic PS2 exploit. This exploit involved one of the PS2 demo discs that came with the console in most of the PAL region. Any demo disc with a build of YaBasic on it could be used to exploit any PS2, even 90K models, without needing too much effort. YaBasic, also known as Yet Another Basic, is a basic interpreter, originally made for Windows, that allows users to make their own programs. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Yar Basic was officially brought to PS2 by Sony themselves as a pack-in demo disc that let Sony sell the console as a home computer and not a games console. With Yar Basic having no major forms of security, CTURT took advantage of the program to run his own exploit on the PS2. This exploit, however, is only practical with PAL region consoles. While it's theoretically possible to use it on NTSC PS2s, the user would need to make their console region free to play the demo disc, which would mean you already have an exploited console. Did you also know that the GameCube was surprisingly difficult for hackers to crack? Or that Nintendo had a software update arms race with modders on the Nintendo Switch? For more facts, check out the Did You Know Gaming videos on GameCube and Nintendo Switch piracy and hacking.